Okay, great. Well, I'm Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz. I'm thrilled to be here. And my big idea is if we could take human medicine and veterinary medicine and bring them closer together, I believe we could create a species-spanning approach to medicine which could benefit all of the patients on the planet. Okay, so I'm a cardiologist. I take care of patients with heart attacks and congestive heart failure. And I do it here at the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. But I'm also a member of the Medical Advisory Board for the Los Angeles Zoo. So from time to time, I get a call from one of the veterinarians that there's a patient that they want some help with. And I love to do this. I get in my car, I go to the zoo. And a few minutes later, I'm taking care of animal patients under the supervision of the veterinarians. I've looked for a torn aorta in a gorilla, assessed a macaw for a heart murmur, ruled out constrictive pericarditis in a sea lion. In this picture, I'm listening to the heart of a lion after we removed a dangerous amount of fluid from the sac surrounding her heart. But I want to tell you about one experience I had at the zoo that changed forever how I think about medicine. The veterinarians had asked if I would come to the zoo to look at the heart of a tamarind named Spitzenbuben. Now, tamarind, <laughs> tamarind are adorable little Central American monkeys, and this, uh, this tamarind was not well. They were sedating her, and as she was getting sleepier, I crouched down and I looked closely into her eyes. I was trying to create a trust bond. It's something that I do with human patients. But as I was doing that, the vet put his hand on my shoulder and said, please stop looking in her eyes. You're scaring her, and you're going to give her capture myopathy. I did as I was told, of course, but I'd never heard of capture myopathy. I went home and I learned about it. I learned that animals from flamingos and other shorebirds to hoofed animals like deer and elk to rabbits and others can, when they are stressed, when they're terrified, when they sense impending predation, have an episode of acute heart failure and sometimes die from it. While I'd never heard of capture myopathy, this resonated with a recently characterized human syndrome of stress or fear-induced heart failure. We knew, for example, that patients who had experienced natural disasters or terrorist events sometimes could succumb to cardiovascular death. This figure shows a spike in heart attack-related deaths on January the 17th, 1994, the date of the last major earthquake in California. But what was interesting was not so much that there was, I mean, it was interesting that there was this similar syndrome with the different names, you know, capture myopathy on the animal side and stress myopathy on the human side. What was really interesting and exciting was that there was this gulf. That for about, it had only been about 10 to 15 years since we physicians were aware of fear and stress-induced cardiomyopathy in human beings. But veterinarians in their literature, they had been diagnosing, treating, and preventing capture myopathy for over 50 years. And I became, became very interested in the question, what else do veterinarians know that we physicians don't know? But the first thing I needed to find out was, how overlapping are the diseases of animals and humans? So I developed a strategy. If I saw a condition in a human patient at UCLA during the day, I looked for it in the veterinary literature in the evening. And I asked, do animals get breast cancer? Do they get sudden cardiac death? Can an animal get Hodgkin's or melanoma? What about brain tumors? What about sexually transmitted diseases? And I included psychiatric syndromes as I saw them. Can an animal develop an anxiety disorder, an eating disorder? What about self-injury? And the answer to every one of these questions was a resounding yes. Now, as I've given this lecture to groups of veterinary faculty and veterinary students, as the yeses float up there, they all nod like this. Of course, this is what they do. They take care of these patients. But when I show the same slides to groups of physicians and medical school faculty, I hear, whoa, Interesting, cool. <laughs> it is new information for physicians. There is a gulf between our fields, and there is a cost to that gulf, and there are opportunities. I've spent the last five years looking at the question of opportunities. How might we improve human medicine by accepting the reality that we human beings are animals and reaching in the world of veterinary medicine and wildlife biology to uh, bring some of that information in a translational way back to human medicine. Let me give you a couple of examples. 
Veterinarians are aware that breast cancer can occur in any mammal. They've seen it in camels, dogs, cats, even whales. They know that there are certain mammals that are predisposed to breast cancer. For example, certain breeds of dogs, English Springer Spaniels, and Venezuelan Jaguars, many of whom have the BRCA1 mutation, which predisposes some human women to breast cancer as well. Interestingly, and I think very notably, there are certain mammals veterinarians know almost never get breast cancer. What they call the professional lactators, dairy cows and dairy goats, who lactate their entire lives. As a physician and a scientist, this is intriguing to me, hypothesis generating. This kind of information should not be sequestered on the veterinary side. It needs to translate over to the human side. It turns out that we physicians are not the only doctors who have patients who have multiple sexual partners and don't practice safe sex. <laughs> There's an epidemic of chlamydia that is ravaging populations of koala in Australia. Um, at rabbits and dolphins, syphilis and, and herpes, veterinarians have unique and, and effective ways of controlling the spread of those diseases. Veterinarians decades ago realized that certain populations of wild animals are getting fatter and asked the question whether there could be endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment that could be contributing to a species spanning obesity epidemic. Again, information that needs to be brought over to the human side. There are also psychiatric syndromes, trichotillomania and feather plucking disorder, which are homologous. I'm going to move quickly through these as my time is is going on. There are interesting um, self-induced uh, self vomiting syndromes in marine mammals and, and great apes that have correlates to bulimia and some interesting insights in terms of treatment. And also something called the thin swine syndrome, which is a stress-induced form of self-starvation that is seen in um, some uh, pigs. Farmers and uh, veterinarians have unique and effective ways of dealing with that, which I believe belong also in the hands of psychotherapists, psychiatrists, and physicians. The bottom line is that in human medicine, we, are, we try to increase our knowledge by translational um, research. We try to bring knowledge from the, the, the basic laboratory and the bench to the bedside. But I believe we're overlooking another form of translational knowledge, what I call species-spanning translational knowledge, knowledge that we can take from oceans, the sky, from the world of wildlife biology and veterinary medicine and bring it to the human bedside and then push it out again towards animals at large. Because, as Rudolf Virchow, the father of modern medicine, said, between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience obtained constitutes the basis of all medicine. I'm moving this forward by having Zubiquity conferences, bringing our fields together. This is the dean of the vet school and the medical school at the UC. After all, if we human beings are animals, then all doctors are veterinarians. We physicians have a single species focus. It's time for physicians to join veterinarians in thinking beyond the human bedside to barnyards, jungles, oceans, and skies. Because the fate of our world's health doesn't depend solely on how we humans fare. Rather, it will be determined by how all the patients on the planet live, grow, get sick, and heal. Thank you.